So I would like to t t talk about the international classification of diseases, which was um, developed by World Health Organization, and why we need aging there. Uh, I personally know at least two drug developing companies which uh, develop drugs against aging, but they had to register it or try to register it uh, for the diseases of some specific organs which is a big uh, waste of time and money and health uh, because these uh, therapies are supposed to have systemic effects. Why? Because, as they say, uh, aging is not a part of uh, ICD. So why this uh, international classification is used? It is, it is used for mortality statistics, for uh, diagnostics, uh, for clinical practice guidelines, uh, you have to name it exactly as it is in the ICD, uh, for new drug and other therapy registration, and for funding, uh, like uh, refundability uh, of medical treatments by insurance organization. Before there was R54, uh, senility in the 10th version of the international classification of diseases, and now 11th version is being developed, and it is about to be finished. They, need, they promised to uh, adopt it in 2018. So basically they removed the senility and replaced it with old age. So uh, me and a group of my colleagues, uh, we decided to uh, see if uh, we can uh, help to introduce aging in some form at least to the ICD. Uh, when you work with organizations like World Health Organization, Ministries of Health, you need to think not of uh, animal models, not of uh, C. elegans and mice, but only of humans. This is evidence-based medicine, and I think only basically two first levels, in maximum third level, should be used. No naked red mole, no nothing like that. Um, although these are two wonderful studies. So basically, a World Health Organization proposed an international of disease in 2011, which means that disease is something for which you have symptomatology, manifestation, uh, etiology, so underlying mechanisms and um, agents, like molecules, course and outcome, treatment response, like interventions which are working, linkage to genetic factors, linkage to interactive factors. So we did uh, undertake an effort to try to see if there are all these uh, components for aging, and if we call it, we can call it officially a disease. Regarding uh, symptomatology, uh, we have uh, at least three groups of biomarkers now, and some complex complexes of biomarkers. Uh, first, of course, uh, frailty indexes. They are already developed well enough to be uh, to serve in um, the, as endpoints in FDA uh, registered clinical trials. There are function biomarkers in there, uh, so-called blood-based or I don't know urine-based biomarkers. And there are wonderful uh, works uh, by people who are here, like your work, by Alex, by other people, who are showing us that these biomarkers could have, and especially in combination, quite nice predictive power. So this is uh, so which you do have a uh, science and symptoms of aging. Then etiology, that was the hardest one. Uh, we screened medical literature. Uh, we just couldn't find it for humans. There were a lot of nice work for um, animals uh, and general aging, but for humans we couldn't find it, so we had to screen it. Maybe we were wrong, but still. How different organs uh, age and what is in common? Like how does liver age, how does, I don't know, brain age and everything. So we uh, identified something uh, similar to hallmarks of aging with some variations which are basically um, of course inflammation, cells senescence, proteostatic failures which are different kind of process but still we united them, body composition changes, uh, less uh, muscle, lean muscle mass, more fat, 
uh, less useful mass in general, mitochondrial dysfunctions quite different. Actually, we put a calcium metabolism dysfunction there, so it's only partly mitochondrial, but still. A hormone system aging, fibrotic propensity, which is unfortunately not as popular in our community as it should be. It's a very big issue. It makes things irreversible. Insulin resistance, and then uh, some organs aging, like cardiovascular, liver, and kidney aging, they can start new cascades of aging, of pathogenesis by themselves. Actually, uh, neural aging also can do it. Yes, maybe it's not complete list, uh, but it's close to complete. Maybe there should be DNA damage, calcium metabolism, but it's, the complexity of aging is not, um, not eternal. It is finitive. Uh, and you can see that this um, pathological, unfortunately I cannot go back, but these pathological um, processes, they are interrelated. So it's really the united uh, process of aging, even though it goes with some variations. So for, we believe that for mechanism we also have yes. Course and outcomes, we composed the list of aging related pathologies. Actually, I guess we outwelled with our organization with that. I will not let you have you uh, stare as much. But the, obviously, the signs are quite um, clear. They can be right in individuals, but generally, we know how aging looks like. And interventions, that's interesting. We only took interventions for which you have uh, meta reviews, or at least a clinical trial, one or two. In this case, it would be in brackets. Nothing animal. Uh, if it's with um, asterisk, that means that it, it works for some specific organ or something, or some specific group of patients. So there are interventions which work not for one uh, pathological process of aging, but for many. Uh, so there are anti-aging interventions, sort of jury protectors, and this is not complete list. Uh, of course, some are specific for some group of people, but still, there are interventions. So what we see, uh, we have aging having all signs of disease, which have been officially proposed by the World Health Organization. Basically, yes, aging is a disease. This is our conclusion. Uh, of course, it's semantic disease syndrome, but all signs are there. So what we did, we submitted this proposal to the World Health Organization, and interestingly, they reacted. They wrote that um, some of our signs of aging are already there, others are not describable enough, so they proposed that they put uh, a variable aging related into the category extension code so that uh, clinicians or somebody else could uh, take any relevant disease from ICD and uh, add age related. Uh, we were actually quite surprised <laughs> with this development and that the World Health Organization really reacts if you, if you talk their language. Uh, so we tried to make this uh, exercise to try to see what kind of new diseases are there, would be newly formed diseases. There is acquired immunogene immunodeficiencies, and we, uh, there, is, there would be, for example, aging-related acquired immunodeficiencies. Aging-related abnormalities of plasma protein. That is big, by the way, <laughs> because it's very broad. Aging-related acquired atrial abnormality, and so on, and so on. Aging-related uh, ovarian dysfunction. Who treats it now? Nobody does, so we open uh, the window, kind of. Uh, it's still uh, a project, a draft better version, but it is supposed to be adopted in 2018, and this thing is there. It is not exactly what we asked. We asked for aging to be considered a disease, but this is some development. Uh, it might change nothing for clinicians, but it might change things for uh, new therapies, new drug developers, because it might, we hope at least, uh, for them to uh, make it easier to register anti-aging drugs. At least we hope so. Yeah, uh, so what we need now, 
First, we need to understand what happened and what needs to be happening. So we need to understand the needs of new therapy developers, of investors, of uh, medical community, of patients, of governments, and so on. So we need to understand what is really we want from the ICD. Ideologically, yes, aging is this sounds good, but what will bring more result? What kind of formulation? And this is question to any of you. Uh, we need, to, if we speak on advocacy, we need to use evidence-based approach, not uh, kind of our wishful thinking, which is happening sometimes to everybody. Uh, we need medical community, geriatricians, just other, the whole medical community on board, this is for sure. And one thing which we met is we realized that it's just too much information for any brain to keep in mind. Maybe Obrady Gray or Alexei Muskalev or you know, Alex Jarvis or Pensal, people could keep it in one hand, but I, could, I saw colleagues who are working with me reading a paper and in fun minds they couldn't even remember. We are privates with private brain, <laughs> we cannot remember it. We need artificial intelligence to process all this information. So I complained about that to my colleagues and also I met the situation that these geroprotective drugs, um, you know, they're really good for cancer patients. They improve survival quite a lot. And this is not wishful thinking that matter areas, but they don't uh, get prescribed to patients because just doctors don't know that the system has inertia. So I complained to my colleagues, and I'm very happy that Nikolai Kruchkov, who is there, uh, decided to try to sum up this uh, project uh, about artificial intelligence, uh, uh, natural language processing, reading uh, PubMed for us, and giving some structured synthesis. I see there is a lot of synergy in this uh, whole, and a number of presentations were also on similar project, which should obviously uh, cooperate. So this project uh, basically should help scientists, but also it can help patients, uh, because as you, as you see, it's really real examples that, uh, for example, women with breast cancer, they don't get prescribed melatonin or you know, metformin or vitamin D, but there are materials which is telling that this improves survival. And no doctor, like except for maybe um, some prescribed, because just it's uh, not we are not perfect features. So we are trying basically. We want to have, if we succeed, hopefully let's all succeed together. Uh, two models: one for scientists and one for patients and medical professionals. Uh, there are 21 professionals. Five of advisors are here, including your pretty great. Uh, and I'm calling you to cooperate with our team, um, first academically for advocacy advocating of health organization and business-wise too. And I would like to uh, thank these individuals who directly specifically helped uh, in composing this paper and this presentation. Uh, thank you.